The front door creaked open and I dragged myself through it, exhausted from another long day at the office. As project manager for a major construction firm, the stress had been piling up lately with our biggest development project yet on the line. The clicking of my modest heels across the tile floor echoed in the entryway. Home sweet home, I thought sardonically. My eyes drifted upward and fixed on the wall lining the staircase. An eerie sensation crept down my arms. There, hanging several feet above the floor, was my daughter's smiling face. Her bright eyes and rosy cheeks were frozen in a look of joy. But there was no body attached. Just her disembodied face suspended in midair like a macabre decoration. I froze, blinking hard. It had to be some kind of optical illusion or a portrait that had fallen at a strange angle. I stepped closer, my breath catching in my throat. No, this was no mere decoration. This was undeniably Emily's face, hovering with no means of support. Emily? My voice quavered. Only silence answered. That's when the panic hit me like a punch to the gut. I bolted up the stairs, calling Emily's name over and over. Her bedroom, the playroom, every corner of the house, all empty. My heart pounded as I scoured every room, looking under beds, in closets, anywhere my little girl could possibly be. But there was no sign of her. I rushed back downstairs to the floating visage. Looking closely, I now saw that the edges were tinged with an eerie glow. This was no hallucination. A sick feeling roiled in my stomach as I reached a trembling hand toward the apparition. My fingers passed right through with a cold, tingling sensation. I gasped and stumbled back. Just then, a disembodied giggle rang out. Emily's melodic laughter, coming from everywhere and nowhere at once. I whirled around desperately. Emily, where are you? Another round of giggles filled the air before fading ominously away. It was then that I noticed the photos lining the wall. In every framed image, Emily's face had been replaced with that same smiling visage from the stairs. My breathing grew ragged. This had to be some kind of twisted nightmare. I fled from the house in a panic, barely remembering to grab my keys. As I reversed out of the driveway, the motion sensor light flickered on, illuminating the garage door. My blood turned to ice. There, covering the entire garage, were hundreds of drawings in crayon depicting Emily's severed head. The bright colors contrasted sickeningly with the gruesome subject matter. They seemed to leer down at me as I peeled out onto the dark road. My mind raced as I sped toward my sister's house. Julie would know what to do. She always had an explanation when things got weird ever since we were kids. I pulled into her driveway with a screech and practically fell out of the car. I rang the doorbell over and over until Julie finally opened it, worry creasing her face. Sarah? What on earth, Dash? I burst past her. It's Emily, something happened, her face, the drawings, I can't find her. The words tumbled out hysterically. Julie guided me to the living room couch, her brow furrowed in concern. As I sank into the plush cushions, she hurried to the kitchen and returned with a glass of water. I gulped it down greedily. Okay, slow down, Julie said in a soothing tone. Tell me exactly what happened with Emily. Haltingly, I described the disembodied face and the bizarre occurrences in the house. Saying it out loud made it sound insane, but Julie listened intently. When I finished, she let out a long breath. I won't pretend I'm not disturbed. But let's think about this logically. I sighed. Same old practical Julie. She continued, there must be an explanation. Have you considered sleepwalking? Or some kind of prank? I gaped at her. This was no prank. You didn't see, feel, that face. And Emily's nowhere to be found. Julie held up her hands. Okay, but we need to call the police. Report her missing. She picked up the phone. As Julie spoke to the dispatcher, I wrung my hands anxiously. Police searches, flyers, all the usual procedures would happen. But I couldn't shake the feeling that whatever took Emily was beyond normal cops and procedures. I managed to recount the story somewhat coherently to the officers who arrived to take my statement. Mercifully, they didn't press me on the unexplainable details. Before they left, Julie pulled one aside, dropping her voice to a whisper. I strained to listen in. 
It's the grief, I heard Julie murmur. Her husband died in a car accident last year. She hasn't been the same since. I'm worried she's having some kind of breakdown. I bristled but held my tongue. Of course they thought I was crazy, but I knew this was real, and I was going to get Emily back no matter what it took. Julie insisted I sleep on her couch that night. As I lay staring up at the ceiling, listening to the soft tick of the hall clock, I knew I wouldn't get a wink of rest. Because for the first time, I noticed that even the clock's face had been replaced with Emily's empty smile. When the pale light of dawn crept through the curtains, I slipped out of the house before Julie awoke. I stopped for a triple espresso to fuel my wired mind and nerves. As I sat staring out the coffee shop window, the latte foam slowly dissolved, taking on the shape of Emily's smiling face. My heart stuttered. I shoved the cup away. Hallucination or not, it was a sign. I had to keep investigating. Several hours later found me sitting cross-legged in our attic, dusty books and papers strewn around me. There had to be something about the history of the house, its previous owners, a dark event that could explain Emily's disappearance. As I sifted through old documents, I came across our deed. The list of previous owners gave me pause. From 1967 to 1971, the property had been in the possession of one Anna Myers. For reasons unknown, it was seized by the county after her premature death at 28 and sold to new owners. I reached for another precarious stack of papers. A few old photographs slid out. I gasped there was Anna Myers, an attractive brunette, standing in front of a newly built home. Our home. But Anna's smile in the photo was all too familiar. It was the exact smile from Emily's floating face. A loud thump came from downstairs, causing me to jump. I crept down from the attic, heart pounding. In the living room, the antique mirror that had belonged to my grandmother was lying on the floor. I knew I hadn't touched it. As I went to stand it back up, a flicker of movement caught my eye. There on the cracked glass was Emily's reflection, smiling ghoulishly back at me. I smashed my fist into the mirror in rage and anguish. What do you want from me? I cried out. Blood dripped down my knuckles, mingling with tears on my cheeks. When I looked back at the fractured glass, Emily was gone. Clearly this Anna Myers had something to do with Emily's disappearance. I needed to find out more about her. Luckily, as a former resident, there were records at the local library. I flipped anxiously through the archives until I came across a 1972 article titled Woman's Sudden Death Shrouded in Mystery. I read it voraciously. Anna had been found dead of unknown causes in her home at 28. No visible injuries or toxins. Some suspected suicide, but others believed foul play was involved. Weeks before, police had been called to Anna's home over noise complaints of manic laughing and crying. Anna claimed she lived alone, but suspicious neighbors swore they saw a child's face in the windows. Police found nothing. Anna was described as a loner and recluse who spent hours alone. The parallels hit me like a blow. The laughing and crying, the smiling child's face, this was no coincidence. Anna must have done something twisted in life and death to my little Emily. Fury boiled up inside me. The article mentioned Anna was buried in a cemetery plot purchased by the county. I knew what I had to do next. Under the moonless night sky, I drove to the old cemetery's wrought iron gates. With shaking hands, I followed the ancient map to Anna's grave. The earth was packed hard and gritty as I clawed at it desperately with my bare hands. As I ripped away clumps of dirt, my fingers brushed something smooth. I recoiled initially, then steeled myself to keep digging. Soon the wooden coffin was exposed. I pried open the rotted lid, gagging at the dank smell. There lay Anna Myers, reduced to bones with scraps of hair still attached to the skull. The empty eye sockets seemed to stare up at me malevolently. What have you done with my daughter? I screamed hoarsely. Give her back to me. I grabbed the fragile skull with both hands. A jolt of energy shot through my palms, nearly causing me to drop it. Then, before my eyes, ghostly sinew, muscle, and translucent skin spread over the skull. Dull brown hair sprouted from the scalp. Finally, Anna's face materialized, that same smiling face, her eyes boring into mine. 
Then, to my horror, the jaw creaked open unnaturally wide and a wail emanated from deep inside the throat like the scream of a dying animal. I shrieked and released my grip. Anna's head hit the ground with a sickening crack. Then silence. The phantom face dissolved until only a skull remained. I scrabbled desperately from the grave, nearly paralyzed by shock. What kind of unholy abomination was I dealing with? As I sped home, one name kept racing through my mind. Father Thomas. Our local parish priest had always been a trusted spiritual advisor ever since I was a child myself. Surely he would know what to do. I burst into the church at sunrise, earning a bewildered look from Father Thomas setting up for morning mass. In a rush, I told him everything. Emily's disappearing act, Anna Myers, the loading faces, the cemetery. His expression shifted from confusion to deep concern. He made the sign of the cross over me hurriedly. Sarah, this is gravely serious, he said. The spirit you've encountered appears to be dangerously obsessed with you and Emily. My heart seized. Why us? What does it want? He shook his head. Some spirits cling to life so desperately they lose their humanity. They seek the living to harvest their energy to regain some semblance of their own. I shivered involuntarily. So this Anna wants to feed on Emily? I'm afraid so, Father Thomas said grimly. But we will get her back. He grasped my shoulder gently. Have faith. He retrieved a small pewter case from the vestry. Inside rested an ornate silver crucifix on a chain. This holds great protective power, he explained, placing it around my neck. Keep it close at all times. He also gave me a vial of holy water, rosary beads, and an ancient Aramaic text detailing spiritual warfare. As we left the church, the first rays of sunlight washed over us. I finally felt a spark of hope. With these holy tools and the priest's blessing, I knew I could conquer whatever evil had taken my Emily. When I returned home, a new sense of purpose flowed through me. No more fear. It was time to take the fight to Anna. I marched up to the floating face with steely resolve. Holding up the crucifix, I commanded in a clear voice, Anna Myers, in the name of God, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit, I banish you back to the realm of shadows. Release Emily now. The smiling facade flickered briefly, then resumed its empty gaze. A mocking laugh echoed around me. I clenched my jaw stubbornly. Fine. This called for drastic measures. In the attic, I dragged out the antique mirror now sporting a jagged crack down the center. I angled it carefully until the fractured glass reflected Anna's hovering face. Taking the holy water, I slowly dripped it onto the mirror's surface, letting it pool around the reflection. An unearthly wail pierced the air as steam sizzled from the point of contact. The face convulsed grotesquely, shriveling in on itself until it shrank down into nothingness. I waited tensely, expecting Anna's visage to reappear, but the hallway remained free of any phantom faces. Had I succeeded in dispelling her accursed spirit from my home? A new sound drifted to my ears, the long, drawn-out creak of a door slowly swinging open. I froze, listening intently. There, the creak came again along with a shuffling footstep. It was coming from the attic door at the end of the hall. My pulse raced as I crept toward the door. I eased it open, holy water at the ready. The musty attic lay before me, illuminated in streaks of light from the small window. Dust motes drifted through the air. The space appeared empty. I was about to pull the door closed when a low groan stopped me. There, concealed in the shadows, was a figure crumpled on the floor. I cautiously crossed the threshold, my shoe crunching on something. I looked down to see a drawing of Emily's face. But rather than the earlier disturbing images, this one depicted her as peaceful and asleep. As I drew closer, the figure shifted slightly. To my immense relief, it was Emily. She was curled up beneath the eaves, clutching her favorite teddy bear. Dark circles ringed her eyes, but she was blessedly real and whole. I dropped to my knees and pulled her into my arms. She nuzzled against me weakly. M mom, she murmured. You found me. Tears of joy streamed down my cheeks. Oh, baby girl, you're safe now. I learned that Emily had awoken to find Anna looming over her bed, whispering about being her new mother. 
Frightened, Emily hid in the attic until I rescued her from that nightmare. As we embraced, I knew I would never let anyone or anything hurt my daughter again. The evil spirit of Anna Myers was gone for good. In the following days, Father Thomas came to bless the house and perform a cleansing ritual. Julie stopped by often too, apologizing profusely for not believing me. I reassured her all was forgiven. Emily, thankfully, suffered no lasting effects other than the occasional nightmare. With time, our lives regained a sense of comforting normalcy. Yet I kept the crucifix, rosary, and holy water close, a reminder of the supernatural forces I now knew lurked just beyond the veil. Emily was my anchor to the light, giving me strength and purpose during even the darkest, most trying times. Her smile chases away the shadows, bringing hope. Wherever she goes, I will follow without hesitation. For her precious soul is worth braving any haunted realm.